Magister of the High Court. She now serves, or she now serves as the manager legal services at the Namibia Revenue Agency. The next one is the ace taxman, Mr. Idi Itope. Mr. Itope is NAMRA's head of domestic taxes and has over 23 years of experience in tax administration. Prior to joining NAMRA, Mr. Itope was one of the senior officials in the Ministry of Finance responsible for tax administration. The next one is Mrs. Victoria Weyulu. Victoria is a senior manager, customs trade facilitation and compliance at Namibia Revenue Agency with a background of lecturing as she served as a dissertation supervisor lecturer at the University of Namibia with over 10 years of experience in legal space and extensive experience from Geneva where she served as a young professional at the World Trade Organization. She is also an admitted legal practitioner of the High Court of Namibia. Please give a round of applause to our judges for adjudicating the competition with honesty and wisdom. I also have the honor to announce the names of the participants of our competition today. Initially, we received 78 submissions, as uh, stated by Stephen. And after the assessments by the panel of judges, the following persons are the 10 finalists. The first one is uh, Mr. Onesmus Joseph a former police officer, accountant, and now an intellectual property officer at BIPA. His topic is on the impact of counterfeit goods on the national economy. Then we have Lubowski. We have Lubowski Kalimbula. He is a legal intern at the Road Fund Administration and is from Zambezi region. His topic is on the impact of counterfeit goods on the national economy. The next one is Wilhelmine Ndungula. She is a fourth year economic student at the University of Namibia. Her topic is the impact of counterfeit goods on the national economy. And then we have Herman Scriver. He's, he's also an accountant, born and bred at Okahanja. He will present on how can NAMRA propel taxpayers to become tax compliant. The next one is Zambo Mweti. Mr. Mweti is a freelancer landscaper with a deep-rooted love for the environment. His topic is how can NAMRA propel taxpayers to become tax compliant. And the next one is Pamela Kamupingene. Can we see, see her? She's from Comas region and passionate about entrepreneurship and data analysis. Her presentation is on the most effective ways of taxing the digital economy. Then we have Eliaser Kakwambi. Eliaser Kakwambi is not around. The next one is um, David Ileka. David Ileka is an economic, uh, economic student at UNAM and will also present on the most effective ways of taxing the digital economy. 
We also have Innocent Ithindi. He's a student at NAST and will present the topic on the most e effective ways of uh, taxing the digital economy. And the last one is Indileni Oma Etuna Ipinge. She is a media student at UNAM from Amsati region and her topic is the most effective ways of taxing the digital economy. Ladies and gentlemen, those are our participants and uh, we wish them good luck. With this, I end my duty on, on the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's give Mr. Shidu another round of applause, please. And without really any delay, we'll get into the real business of this morning. Uh, but before I do that, uh, besides the judges and their determination as to who they think they are best or most impressed with, you also have an opportunity to make your vote count. What you will be required, whether it's you that are in the room or those that are streaming and joining us uh, virtually, you must just send your SMS to the following number. Those that are streaming live, that number will be displayed. But for the benefit of those that are in the room, that number is, and I'm not seeing anybody taking it down, you, you might want to do that. It's 0811, that's 0811, 410732. 0811-410732. That's the number that you send your, your, your vote to. And what you are expected to do, in the sequence that they will be presenting, so too is their numbers. And you just send the number. We don't want to hear names and... Just now you start calling them by their nicknames because you know them. We don't want that. We, we just want the number that uh, corresponds to the manner and the sequence with which they will be presenting this morning. Now, at this juncture, then let me call on the, on the first presenter. And as indicated, our first topic would be, the next three presenters would be presenting on the impact of counterfeit goods on the Namibian economy. May I call on Mr. Onesimus Joseph, to come to the fore, please. He needs your, he needs your support. He is free to present from the PowerPoint, to walk around if he so wishes, to make whatever impression he wants to make on you and the judges. Mr. Onesmus, the floor is yours. You've got your 10 minutes. And we are, we, are, we are timing this to 10 minutes, strictly 10 minutes. When the 10 minutes are up, I'll get an indication and we'll ask him to, to leave the stage if he's not concluded by then. Your 10 minutes starts now, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and good morning to you. My name is Onismas Joseph. This morning, I'm going to present on a topic of counterfeit on the national economy. I would want, actually, to look at the relationship between these variables and how do they affect the, our national economy. And in the end, I should either be making it to say there's a positive relationship or a negative relationship. <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen, many may agree with me that the 21st century, it's become one of the centuries in history that experienced a lot of challenges. Challenges from climate change, uh, pandemics, and the last one is the growth, of, growth in technology. The growth in technology, they brought a number of aspects, including the e-commerce platforms such as Facebook, WhatsApp, become platforms that necessitate trading of goods and criminals. They have seen that opportunity and they're using it very well. It's in the study disclosed, 3.3% of international trades are counterfeit goods that run about 460 billion US dollars. Compare that to our national GDP. We are at 23 billion as it stands. It's not good at all. Counterfeits, including clothes, medicine, pharmaceutical, and many other carpet as well. And 
counterfeit itself as a concept, it refer is an act of using somebody's intellectual property without their consent. You are using somebody's trademark to deceive consumer that these goods are genuine while they are not. I come up with a theory to say counterfeit is equal to unauthorized use of intellectual property. But for the benefit of the house, intellectual property is defined by World Intellectual Property Organization is to mean intangible assets that emanate from creative mind of individual that includes trademark, patent, design, and copyright. But the fundamental questions that maybe we should ask ourselves is, is it counterfeit allowed in Namibia? Probably not. We have framework that lead to that. Through NAMRA, there's a Custom and Excise Act that prohibit export and import of uh, counterfeit goods. We have the Industrial Property Copyright Act and Merchandise Act. On an international level, Namibia is a member of World Trade Organization and a signatory to the most common treaty referred to as TRIPS, Trade Related Aspect of Intellectual Property. And this treaty mandates member states to ensure that they come up with minimum standard on enforcement of intellectual property. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to announce that this provision has actually been domesticated in our national law, the uh, Custom and Excise Act. So is, is, does counterfeit happen in Namibia? Yes, 2003, there was an operation done by Interpol, and it indicated that a number of good 1.2 million US dollars was confiscated in Southern African country, including Namibia. 2004, police operation led to a 14.5 million worth of counterfeits, and 2020, it's some of 5 million worth of counterfeit goods were, com were actually confiscated. Why should we talk about counterfeit? Why, do why does it matter? The first thing is that counterfeit is busy feeding on our economy. It's a virus that is busy feeding on our economy, as we see the pictorial up there. The first thing is that it reduces government tax. The moment we allow counterfeit, they many a times is that they is economy. The second one, it, uh, counterfeit undermines intellectual property. Innovators, they are busy out there innovating, coming up with a, a solution to our industrial problem. But in the end, if we allow counterfeit, that means that there will be no new business to be opened up and we will lose out on, on different types of tax, corporate tax and individual tax. And in the end also, our economic growth it will shrink down. Ladies and gentlemen, counterfeit, it also reduces what we call the direct foreign investment. Nobody want to invest in a country where the market is not reputable. If we have strong measures in place to not allow counterfeit, I'm sure uh, direct investment will keep flowing. And the fundamental aspect also that counterfeit brings about is the, the risk of of goods such as uh, pharmaceutical to our bodies and to the consumers. And in the end, this one, what, does, what it does, it increases government cost on healthy systems because of those counterfeit goods. Ladies and gentlemen, counterfeit is also a, a aid what we call the organized crime. I would want to ask you, if you find a nice branded bag and it appeared that this bag was uh, tailored or manufactured by a child who was trafficked from her family, will you still buy that bag? That is to say, counterfeit fund terrorists, fund organized crime, and we should not allow it. And in the end, it also promotes what we call money laundering that also results in uh, losses in financial sector and affect the economic growth. What should we do? My recommendations, my triple recommendation is that, ladies and gentlemen, we need to amplify our awareness campaign. We need to teach the members of the public about the bad or, and, the, and the negative effect of counterfeits on our society. We should also educate the consumers on the possible ways how they can actually do business legitimately with the owner of the intellectual property through licensing, simply because they have to do business in the end. And also, ladies and gentlemen, we should uh, develop partnership with, uh, with businesses, those who want to import counterfeit, and also educate them how can they detect e-commerce that are selling counterfeits. Ladies and gentlemen, my other recommendation is what I, I, I refer to as we need to work with industries in, in this country. 
what, I would, what I'm suggesting is that we need to establish the inter-agencies whereby all the intellectual property stakeholders in the country, they come together and fight counterfeit. NAMRA need to commission an academic study on the impact of counterfeit on the national economy, a, a, a study that is backed up with data and it contributes to a body of knowledge. We need also to create a database of intellectual property that is protected in the country. And these business people, they want to get access to that and get in, in touch with the, the right holders and the license. It, you are also making easy of doing business and in the end, you are decreasing also the aspect of counterfeit. We also need to engage uh, internet service providers so that those e-commerce that are promoting counterfeit, they will be blocked and not allowed in the country. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we need to build respect of intellectual property. We need to look at our laws if they are fit for purpose. And if not, we need to implement, we need to enhance them in such a way that counterfeit acts should be well punished in the country. Or we need to come up with a standalone laws, anti-counterfeit. Other countries did that. Secondly, we also need to, in that particular law, we can also increase what we call penalties and also encourage foreign intellectual property owners. So to protect their intellectual property in Namibia to enable criminal liabilities. Ladies and gentlemen, we also need to create what we call an anti-counterfeit fund. This fund will help the institutions and the source of fund will be the right holder, the business and the donors. And the main reason for this fund is to say it will fund activities to encounter or to bring about the, the, the counterfeit down. Police operation, number operation and the rest. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, counterfeit has a negative effect on our economy and it should not be allowed. Counterfeit is not all about business and profit, but it's all also about the health and the well-being of our people. As I conclude, remember, when it comes to counterfeit, you can never be too fake. We need to be real. Thanks very much for listening to me. Thank you. Let, let's give him another round of applause. Yeah, thank you so much. He has done that within nine minutes. Uh, we commend you for being efficient. Another round of applause for Mr. Onesimus Joseph. Uh, let's get to the second participant. Luboski Kalibula. The floor is yours. He needs your assistance as well. Thank you. He's not here, here yet. Let's assist him get here. Thank you. Are you ready to go? Okay, your, your 10 minutes uh, start now. standing up here, but I'll try my best. Good morning, judges. Good morning, audience. And to my uh, brilliant competitors, good morning as well. Um, first and foremost, I want to take uh, this opportunity to thank the whole NAMRA team and um, to thank the judges for their time, as well as the contributions made. It is really an honor and privilege to be presenting up here. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Okay, so I will be presenting on the impacts of counterfeit goods on the national economy. That is, thank you so much. That is the Namibian economy. Uh, these are the points of discussion. We'll go through the introduction and um, some other pointers. Now, um, we have heard of the word counterfeit several times. As for me personally, I have only, um, I only heard the word counterfeit when I was in my uh, third year of the LLB program. 
um, in intellectual property. So it is defined as the manufacture, import, export, distribution, and sale of consumer goods that are not genuine, but are designed and branded to look identical to the authentic goods. There is, however, a product that I'm carrying that I'll try to show in order to give a clear picture. It also includes affixing the trademark or logo of a well-known consumer brand to a product that is the Louis Vuitton bags we have seen all around, the Gucci bags, the Dolce & Gabbana. Um, there, there are, however, two types of counterfeit goods. There is non-deceptive, which relates to situations where a customer has been aware of the origin and inferior quality of the product, but they still go ahead with buying the product. And there is a deceptive counterfeit, which includes scenario where the customer um, acts in, in good faith and honesty when buying the product. This means that they are not aware. It's a mistake of law, if I put it into legal terms. They do not know what they are buying and they think it's the original product, only later on to discover that it wasn't the product uh, that they've been seeing around. Um, the slide shows some types of counterfeit goods. Um, we have the Louis Vuitton bags. We also have the Nike Air Force, which we have seen all over Namibia. Uh, the Gucci bags, the Nike. Um, there are instances sometimes where counterfeiters try to manipulate an, um, a trademark or a logo. Uh, in that case, it's Nai, I, something like that. And um, we also have the traditional Jack Daniels, which is now called John's Death, which in my view would um, cause a, a very, very big impact health related. While I'm on that slide, let me try. I have uh, something which uh, looks identical. When I said a non-deceptive, this is what I meant. Um, this was about four or five years ago when I was not yet in law school. We didn't know anything and we bought that. And now we know and it costed less than 500, but when you go in the store, it's more than a thousand dollars. That's how counterfeiters try to do it sometimes. You get it on a cheaper price, on a lower quality. It's not tested, uh, not standardized. Sometimes they brand it as EU, EU, EU tested or the South African brand that it has went through the proper inspections. Also on the far right, um, the top right corner, there is a Jordan uh, logo as well. We have seen it. If we have not, that is uh, one of it. The one on the left is the original one, and on the right is a fake. And the one on the left costs more than the one on the right. And um, this slide uh, talks about um, the revenue and the economic activity as a subtopic in my article. And um, this is uh, one of the ways that counterfeiters um, they try to skate the law which is in place. So for example, we have um, the Custom and Exercise Act in place, which um, controls uh, some products. Um, they therefore don't pay duties and taxes that uh, legitimate manufacturers or shippers and resellers pay. And therefore, um, the revenue is declining steadily. And it also leads to unemployment, counterfeiters. Counterfeit leads to loss of employment. Put it in this way, um, when more products are being counterfeited, there's always an argument that counterfeit uh, products um, creates um, independence, 
um, we have seen the businesses and ease. So um, when more products are being sold, um, the legitimate business owners lose interest in, um, they lose revenue, they uh, also lose out on um, innovative uh, steps. Therefore, it leads to um, laying off of employees, as we have seen. We have seen various bigger companies doing it because um, their projections financially are not what they projected. And mostly it's um, the bigger companies, um, like the Louis Vuitton, who suffer from uh, counterfeit. It also leads to foreign, loss of foreign investment. Uh, companies are hesitant to, to invest in states where um, intellectual property laws are, are weak. And I, I, I'm really hoping the new bill um, really helps out in that regard. Uh, it also leads to for loss of foreign exchange when imported goods are seized. Um, the foreign exchange is lost. We saw last year, 2022, when about... Um, five million of goods was lost and there was a national outcry. But I think that was justified according to the law. Is it time? Okay. It also discourages innovation. As I said earlier, we can see the eases. The one on the left is a fake, the one on the right is the original. The sale of counterfeit products hampers the sale of genuine products and in return it discourages innovation because you cannot keep on doing something and then when you do it I am, inno I am an innovator I come up with an idea it's copied immediately and I will immediately stop and almost there um, this is the world map report of um, showing where counterfeit goods are mostly coming from and I believe we are all aware it's uh, the Asian countries mostly, and um, Hong Kong as well, the Philippines, Colombia, Turkey as well. Now my recommendation, this is where I wanted to spend a bit of uh, time, I'm sorry. We have, let me quickly run through it. Um, my first recommendation is um, registration of trademarks. We have the TRIPS uh, agreement. We also have um, the property and the Industrial Property Act, which helps in that regard, it gives protection to the manufacturers. And also spreading awareness through media. I've seen those bigger TVs, there's one on Van Hill, there's one in Robert Mugabe Avenue. I think through that as well, we can display something. We can, through media, display other things and yeah, uh, stakeholder engagement as well. Also, the laws. Oh, sorry. All right. This is where I end my um, presentation. Thank you so much. Let's give Mr. Kalibula another round of applause. I, I don't like myself for doing that to him, but when we have agreed on terms, I think we cannot renect on it. But we thank him so much. Let's give him another round of applause for the presentation. The, the next presenter on the same topic, and the last presenter on that topic, is Ms. Velamin Dungula. Ms. Velamin, can you please take the floor? And when, when you see me in the corner of your eye, that means you have two minutes remaining. That would be affording you time to run it off. Let's, she, she, yes, thank you. Ms. Dungula, your 10 minutes starts now. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to our judges. Today, I will be speaking on the impact of counterfeit goods 
on our national economy. Now, counterfeit goods are defined as goods that, are, that uses someone else's trademark without their consent. Now, the topic of counterfeit goods has widely circulated our national economy with lawmakers against them and the society not quite sharing the same sentiment. Now, for buyers, it's a good bargain, and for sellers, it is simply good business. Now, according to our national, our Namibian Customs and Excise Act, Section 123.1b clearly states that counterfeit goods are prohibited in Namibia. So what are the impacts of counterfeit goods on our national economy? Let's start off with the disadvantages. Now, disadvantages of counterfeit goods on our national economy include a decrease in government tax revenue, reduction in investment and innovation, a reduction or loss of profits for local producers, and social cost of unfair competition and health and safety hazards passed on to the consumers. Now, starting off with a decrease in government tax revenue, this occurs due to the substitution effect. The simple definition of a substitution effect is simply switching something for another because of lower prices. Now, in case of counterfeit trades, we see that the counterfeit trade activities substitute the activities that exist within the legal framework of state regulation. So what happens is tax revenue is not collected on counterfeit, on counterfeit trade activities. Now, if we look at the table 3A, according to the International Monetary Fund, we see that in our financial period of 2020 to 2021, our tax revenue stands at plus minus 54 million. And then we see a reduction in this tax revenue from 2021 to 2022 at plus minus 51 million. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am not saying that these numbers are completely due to counterfeit trade. However, counterfeit does play a significant role in the, in the reduction of these numbers. Now, don't be alarmed by the lines and the curves. This is simply a Laffer curve that shows the relationship between government tax revenue and tax rates. Now, if you see the area, the blue area, that is the area that government revenue increases without or with minimal counterfeit trade. And then if we see the red area, point number two, that is the area of government tax revenue with counterfeit trade. So you can clearly see that the area with counterfeit trade is much less revenue received. Moving on to the next disadvantage, a reduction or loss of profits for local producers due to unfair competition. Unfair competition is simply when market participants seek to gain an advantage over their rivals by dishonest, mis, mis, dishonest trade. <laughs> so counterfeit goods compete directly with genuine goods. For example, Fabo Farm, a local plant manufacturer of medicinal products, competes directly with local medicines that are counterfeit. Not too long ago, we had some cases of counterfeit medicines. Now, if you see the picture on the, on the right, your right side, <laughs> you'll see that it's a boxing match. Not to say that those in trade of counterfeit and those that are in trade of genuine products should come together and fight. It simply represents trade in counterfeit. As you can see, the bigger man has a much bigger bag. The bigger bag of money only represents the amount of tax revenue that is not collected on counterfeit and profits that go to counterfeit businesses. Now on to our next disadvantage of counterfeit goods, a reduction in investment and innovation. Now according to BIPA, business registrations dropped by 7.3% in 2022. 13,594 business registrations were recorded in 2021, and we see a reduction of these numbers, that is 11,130 business registrations recorded in 2022. Now, this is due to a discouraging investment climate. Now, ladies and gentlemen, once again, it is one of the reasons and not entirely owing to counterfeit trade. So production and trade of counterfeit goods deter honest producers from investing in new products, new ideas, and market development. And finally, on to our last disadvantage, social costs of unfair competition and health and safety hazards passed on to consumers due to excessive payments for inferior products. Now, if we look at the catalog on the other side of the screen, we see an iPhone. I'm sure most of us in here have iPhones with us. So 
if you come across other catalogs with most likely counterfeit iPhones, you'll see that this price is much lower, but it's still an excessive price. So this means consumers still pay an excessive price for low quality products. And consumer health and safety hazards include death, for example, in the case of counterfeit medicine. Now, surely everything has advantages and disadvantages. We cannot talk about the disadvantages without speaking on the advantages. Advantages of counterfeit goods on the national economy include a source of income, redistribution of savings, and cheaper access to technology. Now, counterfeit trade is not only concerned with cheaper prices, but also job creation and a notable source of income. If we trade back to the destruction of counterfeit goods last year, November 2022, According to the Namibian, an individual clearly stated that the counterfeit goods were a source of income. Now, if we look at our statistics, 1.6 million Namibians are living in poverty. 50% of the youth was unemployed in 2022, 18% living below the poverty line, 24% of children stunted by poverty, and 22% of people unemployed. Now, with these numbers, it is unlikely to expect the consumers in the society of large to indulge in the trade of counterfeit goods. Now, another advantage is the increase and redistribution of savings. Lower prices of counterfeit goods means an increase in consumer savings. And if you see the image on the screen, it simply represents the savings and where these savings are redistributed. For example, farming activities and non-farming economic activities. And finally, our last advantage is cheaper access to technology. So more consumers are able to afford technological products and we have a rise in digital economy. Two examples we can take are two digital businesses, for example, the V5 marketing business in Namibia and Taxi Connect digital transportation business in Namibia. Now, we cannot deter the disadvantages of counterfeit goods without negatively without negatively impacting consumers or other agents of the economy. In order for us to deter the negative impacts of counterfeit goods in our economy, we need to reach amicable solutions which do not negatively affect and remove bread off the table for certain agents of the economy. Now, some examples we can speak of, and these are not only amicable solutions, but also sustainable solutions that allow for a sustainable and sufficient flow of economic activity in every agent of the economy. These solutions include the launch of the Code of Good Practice, for example, that was launched early this year, January 2023, which grants preferential treatment to local suppliers, such as youth, women, and SMEs in terms of Part 11 of the Public Procurement Act, Financial assistance, for example, the Development Bank of Namibia's approval of 15.5 million to qualify and skilled entrepreneurs, and then implementation of a policy mix such as the monetary policy, fiscal policy, policies for stricter controls of trade, such as the Customs and Excise Act that I mentioned earlier, and lastly and most importantly, improving access to education and information on counterfeit trade, the impacts of counterfeit trade, and how every variable of the economy, consumers, producers, the government, and financial institutions can be a part of it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Another round of applause for her. She has delivered on an assignment within nine minutes. We also commend her for being efficient, uh, efficiently managing the time allocated to her. Another round of applause to her, please. So that, that then concludes the discussion on the impact of counterfeit goods on the economy. We now are moving to the next phase of our discussion. And the next two presenters will be looking at the how can Namibia propel taxpayers to become tax compliant. The following two participants will be speaking to that. May I then, at this point, then call on Mr. Helman Scriver to please present to us. Uh, Mr. Scriver, thank you. He still needs your assistance. Are you ready, sir? 
Okay, Mr. Scrive, your 10 minutes starts now. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone present. Uh, my name is Yalman Scraver, and my topic for NEMBRA talk is how can NEMBRA propel taxpayers to become tax compliant? Um, Namibia has a source-based tax system, which means that income from source within Namibia or deemed within Namibia will be subject to tax unless a specific exemption is available. Uh, tax compliance refers to taxpayers' decision to comply with tax laws and regulations by paying tax timely and accurately. Uh, the ability to collect taxes is central to a country's capacity to finance social services such as health, education, critical infrastructures such as electricity and roads and other public goods. Uh, NEMRA is established as a legal person and may in the earlier sue and be sued, enter into agreements and hold property and appoint staff. NEMRA is established as an agent of the state for the assessment of tax and collection of state revenue under the supervision and direction of the Ministry of Finance. Uh, NEMRA vision to be a world-class revenue agency with agency serving with passion to positively impact livelihoods of every Namibian. Mission, administer and enforce the tax and custom laws of Namibia with consistency, fairness, efficiency and effectiveness with a focus on the needs of each taxpayer and trader. Our values, guided by a common set of values and principles that underpin our culture and all our actions. Values are integrity, fairness, diversity, efficiency, and agility. Uh, mobilizing innovations in tax compliance. Uh, mobilizing tax resources by broadening and depend, deepening the tax base can lessen countries' dependence, dependence on external funding such as international aid, development assistance, and foreign borrowing. While catalyzing both the improvements in government accountability, responsiveness, and institutional capacity. It has been a well established that strategies to increase tax compliance require improvements in enforcement. That is, incredible sanctions for citizens' corporations that are waiving their full legal obligation. They also require improvements in facilitations, mechanisms, and reforms that make it easy it's possible for taxpayers to find out what they owe and make payments such, such as e-filling and paying via SMS. Yet research has shown that lack of trust in state's role as a tax collector and service provider remains a powerful disincentive for many will be a taxpayer to enter the formal economy or pay their full tax liability. In my approach, trust is compressed of four dimensions. Each of which, which requires special consideration in the design of trust building strategies. Uh, number one, fairness. Tax system should be fairly designed and administrated like the ATA system. Equity. Uh, tax burden should be equitably distributed so that everyone pays their share. Reciprocity. Tax revenue should be translated into, into public, publicly provide goods and services. Accountability, the governments administrating those tax systems should be responsive to taxpayer concerns. <clears throat> Sending simplified messages to taxpayers is a highly cost-effective strategy to, to increase tax compliance. Among alternative persuasive messages, detrained messages that emphasize the legal consequence of non-compliance and the risk of being audited are most effective in increasing taxpayers' compliance. A good example of persuasive message is automated messages that furniture retailers send on a monthly basis, reminding credit customers about their account payments. In order to be tax compliant, you should make sure that you do not have any outstanding tax returns. You do not owe any money to the inland revenue unless payment arrangement or suspension of debt has been agreed to. You are re registered for all tax products that you are liable for. Your registered particulars are updated. 
you have either matched or declared all your registered tax reference, reference numbers. Uh, items. To improve compliance and to make it even easier for taxpayers to manage their tax affairs, the Ministry of Finance has introduced an integrated tax administration system, ITAS. The overall objective of ITAS is to improve service delivery to taxpayers. The system provides many online benefits such as real-time access to taxpayer accounts, a taxpayer self-service facility, online filling of tax returns, a single view of the tax payers account and accelerated process of tax forms, real-time notifications on the outcome. Who should be registered as an e-filler? All registered taxpayers and representatives. Uh, the new ITAS has added hard compliance functionalities. ITAS affords taxpayers an online view of their current compliance against specific requirements as determined by NEMRA. Taxpayers can visual, vis visually identify non-compliance and take the necessary actions to remedy this. The introduction of uh, ITAS empowers taxpayers with more information about their tax compliance and forms the basis for the overall compliance status issued when, uh, issued when an ITAS application is submitted to NEMRA, for example, a good standing and others. Uh, here, here, is the, they are friendly and advice to all, here, is the, here is the friendly advice to all taxpayers and representatives. Get the basic right, calculations and reports. Find your problems before the auditor do. Be consistent every time. Give auditors only what they ask for. Don't be difficult to work with. Focus on the use of tax. Verify any exemptions, certificates. You can negotiate audit terms. Avoid common errors that make, make you a target. Reduce manual processes. Conclusion, as a tax professional, taxpayer, and representative, we should ensure we understand tax law and try our best to comply for the greater good of our motherland, Namibia. Uh, the hardest thing in the world to understand is income tax by Albert Einstein, the genius. Uh, so I'd like, to just thank, I'd like to just thank the commissioner, uh, the chief strategy communications and support engagement, Manager of Communications and Stakeholders Engagement, the CEO of BIBA, the Director of Ceremonies, Judges, Ms. Maganon Nambele, Particip participants and the public at large. I thank you. Well, let's give him another round of applause. He has done that in a record time of uh, less than eight minutes. He needed no reminder, and he had uh, thank you notes for all of us. So we thank you too, Mr. Scraver. Uh, let, let's continue with the last uh, presentation as part of this segment. Uh, that's uh, presenter number five, Mr. Zambo. Mweti, the floor is yours. Again, as I indicated, when you see me in the corner of your eye, that means you have got two minutes remaining. Let's assist him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Testing, one, two, testing. I got it. Okay. <laughs> How are you guys? Nice. If you're with me here today, I see some young more students in the back. Makes me feel so much better. All right. See, so I have a pointer here. Okay. So if you're with me here today, I want to hear you clap three times just to get your attention. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so we're going to talk about how NAMRA can propel taxpayers to become more tax compliant. But what is all this talk about tax and what does it mean? Well, tax is a compulsory contribution to the state revenue that both you and I are obligated to pay. So you're thinking, Zambo, you're talking about obligations and what, 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 what. Why should they take my money? Why should I be paying for all this? Well, it's simple. We have to build public revenue. 
but why do we need public revenue? Ah, uh, Mr. Pointer. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Now, why is tax important? Like I said, public revenue. Public revenue allows for investments in infrastructure such as schools, hospitals, and roads. Citizen services, municipal services, human capital, and much, much more. So why um, should we comply to taxes and what is tax compliance to begin with? Well, tax compliance is the willingness and readiness of public members and organizations to voluntarily contribute and real, um, to voluntarily contribute as well as comply with tax laws and regulations. Keyword, voluntarily. So there are different techniques to make this work, right? And some of them appear simple but they're not quite as simple as they do appear to be. Like for example, me saying simplify the tax system. In order to simplify the tax system, I need an in-depth understanding of what the tax system is and how it works. And already the tax system is simplified to its best by the revenue agencies. So it's not as easy as that, but you and I can help ourselves and do this thing. Okay, another way is to increase transparency educating taxpayers and assisting them, as well as utilizing data analysis and behavioral insights. So when we talk about simplifying um, the tax system, I do not know much about taxes. I'm a gardener, by the way. But I know how to use the internet. And I'm sure all of you here have heard of the word or phrase artificial intelligence before. So, down there, you can see a link to a website called AI Tax. AI Tax literally helps you calculate and pay your taxes on time, and it reduces the error of the chances of human error. It's a nice way to do things. It's fun. It's a different route to take, and yeah, you can do it. And there's this reducing itemized deductions is also one way to make things simpler. Let's carry on. This one is a, is a sensitive topic, transparency. Transparency is something we lack in this country, if you and I are being frank with each other, and we know this. Our taxpayer money is supposed to be used to construct roads, that is being done, to build schools. Earlier this year, I'm sure you've all seen social media flooded with um, videos of children being taught under trees, cats and dogs are raining through the ceilings of their classrooms, and much, much more. Buildings being built with elaborate statues in front of a dilapidated hospital. I will not go into detail, but we know what we're talking about. And like I said, I'm going to step on a few toes, but you know, I'm speaking from a public standpoint here and not like from a company. So yeah, bear with me. Let's continue. <laughs> okay, governments can provide instructional resources and online support. Mr. Helmand Scriver mentioned a very nice one, ITIS. Now, ITIS can be um, upgraded in some sort of way. There are a lot of students from NAST and UNAM who major in development and computer science we can incorporate those people and ask them, how can we make this possible, guys? How can we make it easier for taxpayers to do their thing on their own and reduce human error and just make it a little bit more fun for them, don't you think? Yeah, seriously. And we can educate people on the vitality of tax revenue, what it will be used for, when it's needed, and why it's needed. Like I said, roads and all that and all that and all that. And also, we got to have a little bit of compassion, guys. You know, pads are still being sold for so much. The girl child is suffering. And we are using taxpayer money to source condoms that are inflated over a thousand percent while there are people suffering. Children are being taught under the rain in trees and all that. 
let's have a little bit of compassion. If I see some compassion, I would be more inclined to pay my taxes because I know it's helping my child, the neighbor's child, and the children in the nation to come after me. Okay, let's go on. Behavioral insights. Guys, your registration is expensive. Just tuition in general is very expensive. And it's difficult to keep up with taxes and paying things at different times of the year. So we have to look at things like when do people have the most money? When are they most inclined to pay for things? And just how is money flowing in the economy in different times of the year? Like for example, January to February. You know, we're having a lot of fun in December. January is registrations, school fees, school uniforms. There's not much money to go around. So now you're still telling me I have to pay for taxes. Like, bro, it's not easy. <laughs> So we're going to go on. And another thing I'd like to mention is cognitive load. When I started researching more on taxes, like I said, I'm just a gardener. So I went on the internet and I was like, okay, some tax laws. And I, was just easy. And I got there and I saw these pages and lines and I was like, whoa, what is this? It was so confusing and discouraging to continue reading that when I saw all of that. And that is called cognitive load. And it makes you kind of just want to back away and be like, yeah, no, just, just tell me what I have to pay and I'll pay. I don't really want to know much about it. So it can be made easier by making things much more legible, breaking them down into smaller pieces, and making it more user-friendly overall. In conclusion, there are many ways to get people to comply with taxes, but the number one would be compassion. being able to connect with each other, being honest with each other, using our money for the right things. And everyone will, everyone will play their part. It's as simple as that. It's a group assignment. You, oh, me, you, you behind the screens on Facebook. You know, let's play our part, guys. And shout out to Namra for all of this. Ah, two minutes left. <laughs> Yeah, here are my references. I wasn't just pulling this out of my thumb. And with that, it's time to say goodbye. Finito. Thank you. Danke schön. Merci beaucoup. Louis Tumezi. Let's give him another round of applause. We did say that you are going to have 10 different individuals. Wow, we got it. Uh, another round of applause, please. That's our first segment. Those two topics have been dealt with. We're taking a short break. Not that you are going anywhere. But we're getting entertainment right here. We're bringing it here to you. And then we continue with the remaining five. Uh, le let me call on Mr. George Stein, Senior Customs Officer with the Namibia Revenue Agency. We are not importing anything. It's all homegrown. The floor is yours, Mr. Stein.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's give him another round of applause, please. We, 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 we may now reunite with our seats so that we can continue. I, I, I know that most of you, as he was performing, have already developed your own lyrics for what he was playing. I, I can only imagine what those are or were. But, but thank you so much. Can we now get the, the other contestants, the participants ready so that we can continue? I, I guess I didn't say how long the break would be, right? I, I just assumed that when I said the entertainment would be brought to you, you are not going to move. But you had your own other intentions. Or should I call her? Uh, George back and give us another one. I uh, know the, the next presenter is ready. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with our program. Uh, and at this point, we recognize uh, the presence of uh, Miss Vivian Kashiongwa, who I indicated that she will be joining us as we're progressing. We, we did welcome you at the top of our program. We're now just acknowledging that you have actually joined us. So we thank you, of course, initially for agreeing to, to attend and speak to us in the fullness of time, and, but for honoring that, um, that undertaking. The, the next part, the, the following five participants will be speaking to the most effective ways of taxing the digital economy, and that's the future. Uh, it's not because it's, we think it's the most important topic, that's why five of them qualified in that category. But I guess it's because of the submissions that they've made and how persuasive the, the judges found them. Now, to get us going, let me call on Ms. Pamela Kangumine to start this segment of the presentation. Let's give her a round of applause. Again, the rules remain the same, 10 minutes. When you see me in the corner of your eyes, that means eight minutes have elapsed and you've got two minutes to conclude. Ms. Pamela Kangumine, please. Thank you. I, I, my apologies. The, the surname is Kamupingene. I, I guess it's because uh, in Novitoto, you will find Kangumine and Kamupingene. That's how I confused it. But Pamela, Come up in the place. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
So I'm standing on this side of the mic because I enjoy reading and I enjoy writing. And I particularly enjoy um, opportunities like this that force me to read outside of my general areas of interest. So I am extending a heartfelt thank you to the, everybody that made this opportunity available. And to the dignitaries in our midst, um, thank you for your presence. To the judges, thank you for availing your time. Um, I am not a text expert. So when I, the write-up that I wrote, right, um, advised government to take an indirect approach to texting the digital economy. And um, when I wrote this, given the word limit, and like I said, I'm not a text expert, I thought I had done a decent job of um, doing this right. <laughs> but then I read further in preparation and I realized I was, like, I was mistaken, you know? And, and this is because um, the indirect approach basically puts a lot of pressure or puts the pressure on the consumer who in comparison to the multinational like Facebook or Netflix that is engaging in the digital economy is probably already financially stretched. So when I read up more, um, I realized that there, there, there are other things that, that could make this taxation process um, problematic. So this is what I would like to share uh, with you today. Um, there is a lot written on the subject. So, and, and if you're not a tax person or an accounting person, it can be a bit overwhelming. So I took this approach, right? I basically took one contribution, which is this one, by these two um, uh, gentlemen. And I read up on that, and I'm going to unpack that with you today and see what they had to say and why I, um, what I found problematic about their suggestions, right? So, what they, what is suggested in this, what, why I basically even say why I chose this particular reading was because they, um, the, the arguments that they, they propose, firstly they propose a DTT, which is like a digital data tax, and they propose like an agency that's gonna, almost gonna overlook and oversee um, the digital taxation of all the other like countries and stuff. It is um, funded by the World Trade Organization. And what I chose, why I chose them, why I chose this particular reading was because they, their arguments are sort of cemented in the um, principles and, and policies that govern taxation in general. So they, they, they're arguing from that perspective. And I'm going to share why I found that uh, problematic. So, let me begin by saying how do they define the digital economy, right? So, so they define the digital economy as any economic transaction and by extension business model that comprises one or more digital elements, right? And the digital elements are digital communication, digital content, digital automation, digital distribution, and digital payment. According to the authors, they categorize as, they take, it, they take us from a point of the traditional model, which is like you have your factory, you're, you're in, the, in the country where you are operating and you're being taxed there. And then they, they extend us to what is now the, another model, which basically um, is tax disruptive. And the things that make the digital economy, according to these authors, text disruptive are, made, are basically the, this digital content, digital automation, and digital distribution. Because the other two, the communication and the digital payment, were already there. So basically, it's like when you just digitalize what is already there, like logistics. So if you're able to pay, firstly, you're you are paying cash, but now you're paying um, electronically, that isn't really text disruptive. So there, um, or if you're able to communicate with your, with your employee or with your customer, um, whereas before you were just calling them, now you email them, that is just an additional, you've just digitalized your, your, your business, but you haven't really become text disruptive. And what they mean by text disruptive is those 
um, businesses that function mostly or 100% um, digital, right? They have no fixed premises, and this is what is problematic, because the text principles are based on, on um, that notion of a business being, a government being able to tax a business because the business is located in its a tax um, jurisdiction, right? So the, the principles are these eight principles. And these um, eight principles, these eight principles are meant to, these five speak to tax policy and these three speak to tax administration. And what, we, what they, um, why I found <laughs> what they propose problematic is essentially because they are speaking from the perspective of the developed nations. And yes, Africa is there, um, but it, it, it is more prescriptive as in we have this um, proposal for Africa to, to, to how they're going to text because the argument is that the real, like the script basically has been written already and we are meant to, to, to apply what has already um, been set out for us and it's problematic because it might limit, you know, when we ask the question, how can, what, is, what are the efficient ways of taxing the digital economy? We're sort of like assuming that there is this, we have this some sort of autonomy to, to or freedom to, to, to do that. And to some degree we do, but in actual fact, when you read uh, uh, proposals like this that are funded by the World uh, Bank Group, you realize that there isn't really that much room to maneuver. Yes, we can sit here and tax the digital economy via the VAT or whatever, and even that has some problems of its own. But at the very core of it, we've already been told what we're supposed to do, and, and we are limited in that space, and that is basically what I want, um, the conversation that I want to have with you today. So the, 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 the suggestions made basically take two people into account, two groups. They take the, the U.S. and then they take those countries like the, the, the states, the industrialized countries that have um, put more of their funds into welfare. So the argument basically is that these countries that are the U.S., they're saying, you know what, we industrialized. We put money in developing R&D. We took money in, in, in putting infrastructure and now we are reaping because of that new economy, right? Um, and now you guys, which is more like the welfare, the, 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 the states that are industrialized but focus more on welfare, like Norwegia, Sweden, those kind of countries. Now, they want to tax um, the establishments that are in the digital economy like Amazon and Facebook and all of that. But they're saying that you cannot do that, okay, because we, we, we put effort, right? And then there is Africa. And yes, Africa has the Addis Ababa action agenda, and it is meant to, it is meant to, um, to basically give government, you can tax the digital economy, but when you, when you interrogate the national laws and international laws, the space to do that is very limited. Um, so I am suggesting that we need to interrogate these principles. We need to interrogate and say that, you know what, these principles were created for a certain type of business model. As Africa, we need to be able to say, yes, let us create our own principles and policies and, 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 and uh, administration um, policies that are going to speak to the digital economy as it fits us. Because we also give these um, industrialized nations a market. And, 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 the, and the Namibian government has put in infrastructure like the ITS um, and all of that, that makes me as a consumer or business to be able to engage with Facebook. And I believe for doing that, the Namibian government has a foot to stand on in arguing for uh, taxing the multinationals. Thank you so much. <laughs>
she needs your assistance of the stage. Thank you. Mr. Eliezer Kakwambi, are you in the room? Are you ready? Please come to the stage. Another round of applause for him. You two have 10 minutes and it starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Dorokate. Um, let me just uh, greet everyone by the protocol that was already established. Um, I'm going to present or rather discuss on the uh, mentioned topic that is already actually there presented. Uh, that's basically taxing the digital economy. Uh, I'll be moving, or rather I'll be discussing on the, or I'll move uh, on the introduction. Then I'll just basically go on the ways and then basically I will conclude. Yes. Yes. Um, basically, the digital economy is basically uh, has been defined all over and basically serving a, a bit of uh, difficult definitions. So uh, I'll just go a bit by the definition of Becker, who emphasized that, uh, that the digital economy is basically includes the, uh, the model of the business where basically it includes um, cryptocurrencies, um, applications, stores, online advertising, um, network participative platforms, etc. So this basically are just some of the forms or norms on how the digital economy is. Um, where it's basically, it moves further to say that um, we can notice that the digital economy co concept includes different aspects ranging from there. Electronic commerce, electronic money, crypto coins, games, and online advertising. Um, now, just the lack of this definition or the lack of the comprehensive uh, definition, basically, um, it does not basically give us a proper framework to treat, uh, partly due to the com uh, complexity of defining the treatment of application of to these assets in a way that is basically covers the different parts. and then we move to the, basically the ways. So the ways basically that we are proposing, basically we are looking in terms of the Namibian market. And basically this way, basically I'll be spending some time. Uh, the, first, the first, basically, the first point is basically the integrating of the market. So what do I mean by integrating with the market? Um, I think uh, in 20, 2020, uh, there was a case basically done in uh, Africa, uh, by the, by the, the International uh, Center for Tax and Development of the, so basically this, uh, this, 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 uh, study focus on African countries, basically they took a symbol of six African countries, among those countries were basically Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, Rwanda, and Senegal, whereby basically the, 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 they make a case to see whether it was possible to introduce uh, digital taxing on basically on, 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 on e-commerce and other transactions in Africa. And basically the, 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 the study basically concluded that it was a bit of a uh, uh, kick to, to say we can going to tax the, 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 the digital uh, 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 economy. This is basically due to, to the fact that um, Africa basically is it's, it's, it's having a time lag. What do I mean by that? A time lag in the sense of technology. Because now we, we, we speak in terms of multinational companies because they always find a way to, 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 to evade tax. So hence, if we can basically introduce an integrating digital for a single market, that will actually be, uh, aid Namibia to, to, to tax that. And then my, my second point would be basically introducing a digital sales. A digital sales basically it's focused on, 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 on um, platforms like uh, 
Amazons, Facebooks, and etc. So basically, what we, or basically what they have concluded there, is that um, uh, just 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 by, uh, bear with me that uh, the digital or rather the, the digital sales tax is not the same thing as the digital VAT. So basically, the digital sales tax is basically levied on big corporations. And I mentioned uh, Facebook and Amazon as uh, part of them. And um, this transaction actually are the one that we can say that they need to be levied on. Uh, example of where this basically digital tax has been basically applied is basically you look at uh, countries like uh, France, uh, Austria, uh, where they have basically implied this and they actually impose a minimum uh, 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 digital tax from a 3%. So if Namibia should follow the same step, I think we, 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 we should look at that and we should incorporate, um, incorporate a minimal tax rate. Then we, we move to the, to the third point, which is basically the digital service VAT, which will actually be uh, levied on the sales of digital products and transaction. Now, this is basically now where the whole uh, e-commerce comes in, basically the, the payment of money or basically the sales of goods. This includes downloading games, uh, selling of products online, basically all of them basically can be actually be fall on, 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 on the digital products. So, uh, as I was basically looking on the case study that was done um, in Africa in June, so one of the, 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 the conclusions which basically came, came out there, so we noted that uh, uh, other countries basically had uh, some difficulty implementing uh, the, the recommendation from the study, but uh, countries like um, Nigeria basically uh, went and tried to implement a unitary tax basically on, 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 on that point, which I think if should Namibia basically take a case study in the same line, I think uh, revenue can actually be collected from there because that's basically where a whole junk of the market basically is and a lot of actually uh, 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 sales or revenue is actually gen generated from, 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 from those activities. And my last point is basically the income tax on the digital service. Um, the income tax on digital, uh, it's another way basically to, 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 to look at. Why do I say it's basically another way? Uh, you will look that Namibia basically, it's actually having a market for online trading. Uh, the income, uh, income tax digital services include uh, things like uh, foreign exchange, which is basically the forex market. It includes the crypto, uh, crypto, uh, cryptocurrency trading, whereby I noticed that basically in Namibia, most people, even though, even though that there is no specific law that they basically speak on that, uh, I, I, I guess we, we need to incorporate and also implement laws that basically can, can speak on the, 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 the uh, forex market as well as the cryptocurrency just to govern it so that we can also just perhaps just start taxing on that market because uh, as the world is basically evolving, we will notice that uh, the, the, the world is basically moving towards that. And uh, Germany is actually one of the countries that is basically taxing that, uh, the, the income tax on digital service. And the point basically where Germany is basically relying on is basically on the uh, capital gain. And I actually noticed that Namibia yet did not introduce a capital gain on the market. So if Namibia can introduce a capital gain market or capital gain framework, basically it should actually be a good market whereby we can say, okay, this can also generate uh, money on the, on the revenue. Uh, this is basically just some of the points that basically when we, we, we or rather when I discuss rather the most important four points, we should actually take into consideration that we should avoid increasing uh, in compliance cost. Uh, what do I mean by that? Basically, this is the, the multi-phases of the, 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 the definition basically of being the taxable revenues. And then 
we should also take in consideration the, 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 the setup or the uh, SMEs, because most of the companies in Namibia, they actually fall under the SME and they don't have the financial muscles to pass on this external cost, because when, obviously when you introduce uh, a tax, obviously companies are always try, trying to, 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 to push them on the third party. And as SMEs are coming up, uh, they will not have the financial market or the, I mean the financial muscles to, to, to cope with this. And then uh, lastly, basically just encourage, uh, encourage uh, the, the legal or regulatory certainty. And basically I conclude um, to say that the growth in the digital economy provides an opportunity to NAMRA to increase the revenue collection and expand their tax base. Thank you. Basically these are my references. Let's give Mr. Kakambi Kwambi another round of applause, please. Is that the best we can do under the circumstances? Thank you very much. We, we are midway. We are almost nearing towards the, the, the tail end of these presentations. On number eight is Mr. David Ileka. Please, let's welcome him to the stage. Let's help Mr. Ileka. Thank you. Benjamin Franklin famously once said, in this world, only two things are certain, death and taxes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am David Ileka, an economics student at the University of Namibia. And before you, I bring in my thoughts or not to be the most effective way to tax the digital economy. Whether it's the digital economy or the traditional economy as how we know it today, taxation should exist because the digital economy and traditional economy are all governed by the same laws and fundamental principles. Human needs and wants, supply and demand. The only slight difference is the digital economy adopts modern technology that makes process cheaper, faster, and more efficient. In 2021, an estimated $5 billion Namibian dollars flow through Namibia's digital economy. If we apply a blanket tax rate to this amount, let's use the corporate tax rate of 32%. That is two, nearly, nearly two billion in tax revenue. This highlights why it's important to tax the digital economy. I say the digital economy and the traditional economy are nearly one and the same. So can we tax the digital economy the same way we tax the traditional economy? Well, in short answer is yes. The only slight hurdle is that the the technology in the digital economy is skewed towards decentralization. This simply means in the digital economy, there are no physical borders and the economy doesn't work the same way. To properly tax a system, you first have to identify a transaction and then decide is that, is that transaction taxable or not. Over the past few years, money has been developing in two certain ways to make transactions possible. A is the further digitalization of current money infrastructure, which is, for example, your mobile banking application, digital payment systems, and digital wallets, such as your e-wallets, blue vouchers, and so forth. And B is the adoption or creation of digital currencies, such as cryptocurrencies, that, that change the way we see notes and coins. Now that you understand how money works in the digital economy, this will help us identify transactions in the digital economy and then we decide is it taxable or not. The three main tax types that will be affected in the digital economy is value added tax, corporate tax, and personal income tax. For value added tax, this targets the e-commerce avenues of the digital economy. Think of this, if you go to a shop today, on your receipt you will see 15% has been levied on your total amount. This should, exact, this should work the exact same way when you do online shopping. For corporate tax, it gets a bit more trickier. You have to first identify the type of company it Does it have a physical presence in Namibia? If it does, tax should work the exact same way it currently works. If it doesn't, then you have to use more harsh methods of taxation. A good example is Netflix. Thousands of Namibians use Netflix every month and give an amount or pay for that Netflix subscription. That means every month, for example, Netflix makes a million dollars from Namibian revenue but Netflix currently does not pay a single cent 
to Namibians for the money they make in Namibia. How would we tax this? Well, it's simple, the banking system. Because we identify when a transaction, or be, because we can identify transactions leaving Namibia and Namibian bank accounts, going into Netflix bank accounts, we know exactly how much left that Namibia's ground going to Netflix. We can then calculate a certain percentage of that total and demand it back. It might be harsh to implement, it might be tricky, but when there's a will, there's a way. For income tax, it also gets a bit tricky because there's a lot of advancements, such as the Nomad Visa, that allows us to work in one country while living in another country, thank you to remote working. Again, we can tap into the banking system. If I work for Google in Namibia while living in Namibia, every month Google will send a transaction that will go to my bank account exactly that amount. I'll be then required to go to the bank and declare that amount as my income, and therefore pay tax. I keep referring the banking system and bank accounts. Here is a overly simplified of how the digital economy works. Luckily, in the digital economy, people don't use coins and notes. Money has to flow from one bank account to another bank account. Again, banks. Because when I buy something, or when think of money as a car, and think of the digital economy as roads, we can put roadblocks and stop signs at certain points, and then we can declare tax or demand tax at those various points for various transactions made. And in the digital economy, we get to see every single transaction and we know exactly where the money went and where the money came from. How are we going to allow the banks to simply can play a crucial role in the taxation ecosystem? On the 11th of January, NAMRA released a statement or a public notice that they now approve third-party agents to, play, to do, collect tax on behalf of NAMRA. We can simply extend this power and authority to the banking system. So we don't have to move any mountains or change laws and um, kidnap the banks to play this role. Obviously, with great power comes great responsibility. We have a world banking, banking system, we have a world-class banking system, and we have world-class authority systems. We can simply make sure that we come together and make sure that all, our, all the players in our digital taxation ecosystem are playing fairly and efficiently and honestly. In closing, sorry, in closing, I think one of the easiest ways to tax the digital economy, especially with companies that exist outside the media, is you can create a digital economy participant tax rate. This simply means if I earn money in the digital economy outside the borders of Namibia, I should be paying a tax rate because 1% of a million is better than 0%. I thank you. Let's give him another round of applause. Oh, you have not stopped. Why use 10 minutes if I can only use six minutes and make the point? So thank you very much. Let's give him another round of applause, please. Did, did, did I see a, a familiar signature on the presentation? Or was I mistaken? Let's get to the second last uh, presenter for our well, it's still a morning, very soon, an afternoon, or oh, yes, uh, noon. May I please call on Mr. Innocent Ithindi to come and engage us. Thank you. And it remains 10 minutes. When you see me, it means eight minutes are done. And I guess uh, Mr. Ileka is the only one who has not seen me in the corner of his eye. Mr. Ithindi, the floor is yours. Right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Innocent Ithindi, and we'll be talking about the digital economy. And I'll be explaining what the digital economy is, what exactly is this thing, and why do I call it the unseen, a tax on the unseen. All right, so let's just jump straight into it, right? Okay. Um, we're going to be talking about what the digital economy is, uh, why it's important, why, what makes it special, right? The challenges that it poses to us, as Namibia, and also we'll be looking at effective ways of taxing it. So we'll be starting with exactly what the digital economy is. I would like to refer to it as the modern way that we conduct business and commerce, but using digital technologies, right? So you have online transactions, online banking, online when you order something, when you buy airtime, all of these happen in the digital space. 
And the good thing about the digital, think about back in the day, right? If you wanted to sell something, I think I'm more audible now. If you wanted to sell something, you actually had to get up, you know, physically, go find a buyer just to sell something, right? But with the convenience of the digital economy now, you can sell something at home seated on your couch. So this sounds amazing for us, right? But it doesn't sound too good if you're a tax authority like Namra because it becomes more complicated to track where the money is and all of this and exactly who paid it and all this, right? But let me ask you a question. If certain businesses and individuals, hardworking people, have to pay tax because they're easier to track and to know who paid what, um, but then you have companies in the digital space who are harder to track, should we just let them slide because it's harder to find out who to, to chase and all this stuff? I think not, right? And that is why we're here today. It's an important matter we have to discuss because these companies and individuals have to contribute to, to the digital economy, to the Namibian government and the funds that we need to develop the country, right? And I've identified four methods that we can use to effectively tax the digital economy, all right? And the thing with this is you can't just decide on the four methods. With the same careful consideration and stringent thought, that you apply when you're purchasing your kapana at single quarters, who to buy it from. You kind of have to also decide what methodology are you going to use to tax the digital economy, which one is the most appropriate for it, okay? So transfer pricing and transfer pricing and regulations. Um, have you guys heard of transfer pricing? Okay, it's okay if you haven't. It's not the most uh, interesting topic out there, but... Transfer pricing is basically when a company who has, that has subsidiaries decides to sell to another subsidiary its units but for a lower price, right? And inherently, there's nothing wrong with this. Um, but let, I'll, let's illustrate how it can be a problem, right? Let's say I have a company. I sell nails in Namibia. Our tax rate is maybe 31%. And I have a company in Cyprus where the tax rate is 12%. If I decide to sell to Cyprus my nails to myself, it's a subsidiary for a much lower price, I lower the cost of goods sold to the company in Cyprus, right? And if you start to do the math over here, you can start to see that the company in Cyprus, when it goes on to sell its nails to other third parties, they are sort of inflating their profits and they got away from paying the tax in Namibia. And this is why it's important to, to do this. Um, and section, I believe, 95 of the Income Tax Act is the one that points out the illegality of doing this to, when you're doing it to avoid taxes, that's when it becomes illegal. Okay, now we're gonna continue talking about our favorite topic, tax. So, uh, value added tax, right? Okay, a value added tax is a tax that is added on, at the end of each, at the end, at the end of production, or each production stage and distribution, right? It's a tax that is ultimately a burden of the consumer. So with digital tax, I mean, with the digital economy, we can add this tax also to digital transactions, not just uh, in the same way with the traditional economy, right? So, and, but the thing is, you'll be wondering, does this make things more expensive, right? Well, yeah, it could, but at least these companies will be contributing to the Namibian economy. And they're also incentivized to do it they're not too disincentivized because the burden is once again on the consumer. And if we look over here, we have a graph that illustrates the selected digital markets in Namibia. This is 2021 data. It shows the share, the market shares of digital companies within Namibia, right? And as we can see, like most of these are e-commerce, right? And if you look at the products that they sell, food, D, uh, toys, electronics, media, fashion, in a traditional economy, these are products that a VAT would be applied to, and the government does get this revenue, right? Um, but now because the digital, it's a lot harder to capture, and this is why we, if we add a VAT to digital products or products in the digital economy, we're able to capture this revenue. Okay? And if you're a person that likes uh, money, if you think more in monetary terms, this is the digital revenue projection. Um, what the revenue is projected to do from, it was uh, projected from 2019 to 2026. And if we look at 2023, that's about 6.2 billion Namibian dollars that we're currently at right now. 
So if we do not come up with an effective way of capturing this tax, just imagine the tax revenue we could get from 6.2 billion, right? So we need to come up with effective ways to capture this revenue and adding a VAT to digital transactions is one way that you can do that, right? Okay. And then we'll be looking at withholding tax. All right. So withholding tax is a tax that is remitted, I mean withheld, on payments, and then it's remitted to the government. So when a company buys, let's say a company in Namibia does it, buys a product from overseas, and they have to pay for it, a certain percentage or portion of that money is set aside for taxes. This is one way that we could actually try and capture some of the tax, right? And if we look, think about it, it sort of levels the playing field for the companies in Namibia. Like, let's say you had a, your company here in Namibia. Instead of people running off to go do the transactions overseas, they can now purchase from companies within the country. Okay. All right, welcome to slide eight. <laughs> this is a destination-based tax system, right? So it's in the name, the explanation is in the name. Um, this tax basically says that if you sold to a person in Namibia, pay the tax in Namibia. It's sort of what my colleague over there was saying with the Netflix thing, right? It's very difficult to implement, I must be frank, because going to a large corporation like Netflix or, or, or YouTube or Google and telling them that no, a certain amount of this money now has to be ours, it's gonna be difficult, but we can start somewhere. We can start with the smaller entities. And the good thing about with a withholding tax, I mean, with a destination-based tax system is that it solves the borderless nature, uh, nature of digital transactions. You know, when you do digital transactions, you're not sure where the money is flowing and from where. But with a destination-based tax system, we can say, this happened, the consumer was in Namibia, it should be taxed over there, right? Okay. All right, now to conclude, um, with the right policies, Namibia can effectively capture the tax from these digital entities, right? But with poorly designed policies, uh, companies could be incentivized to just evade the tax, right? If you design a policy that does not incentivize a company to report its taxes, it's most likely not gonna be happy to do it or to do it at all. So from a business perspective, um, we need to be very careful when we design these policies and we could, use, and we also have to be very considerate of what we use the money for to show the general public as well what we're doing with the revenue. If people are not incentivized to pay their taxes, they won't do it. So once again, I would also like to thank a lot of people in the room. <laughs> I'd like to thank my participants there. They made the experience very enjoyable. And um, I'd like to thank the people here from Namra in their bright, uh, not bright, but volcano orange ties. Very, uh, and uh, the people there at the back as well. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And I hope I have provided some insight in terms of practicability, right? Things that you can actually go home and start implementing or thinking about. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, find me in the street and just ask me. Thank you. Let's give Mr. Itindi another round of applause. Also coming in at nine and a half minutes, good use of the time allocated. Indileni omua etuna ipinge. I can imagine what you are going through, having seen everybody come here. But let's put you out of that. Let's give you the platform so that you can shine. The floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Indileni Omwa Etuna Ipinge. I made it to the stage with the topic, taxation of the digital economy. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. I'm quite sure many of you have heard of, sorry. I'm quite sure many of you, if not all of you, have heard of Uber, Yago, Airbnb, Instagram, as well as Facebook. These are digital companies that make money 
digitally. But the question is, are they being taxed effectively? They are not being taxed effectively because tax revenue agencies like our very own NAMRA does not, the way of taxing these companies do not reach or do not achieve the objectives of our tax revenue agencies. And I am here to talk about the five most effective ways that I've found that can help tax revenue agencies like NAMRA to tax digital companies effectively. The five tax, the five most effective ways that I found, one is a destination-based tax system, equalization tax system, withholding tax, value-added tax, and digital service tax. Now let's go deeper. The destination-based tax system works in a way that taxes are applied based on the consumer location and not on the location of the company. What do I mean? I mean, in a destination-based tax system, tax must be calculated, and I say must, must be calculated based on the final destination of the product or service. This means that if a digital product or service is sold to a consumer that lives, for example, in Namibia, let me not go far, and the consumer bought the product from China, VAT of that good should be based on the VAT rate in the consumer's country, which is Namibia. Another great way is equalization tax. This will apply to digital companies that operate in a country similar to the way brick and mortar companies are being taxed. Instead of paying taxes based on their overall global profits, tax would be levied on the revenues of digital companies that meet certain revenue thresholds and would typically apply at a fixed rate, for example, 3% fixed rate. Withholding tax can also be a, a great way and it can be implemented on cross-border digital transactions, which would require the purchaser of a digital good or service to withhold a portion of the purchase price and remit it to the government of the country where the seller is located. Value-added tax, which we all know, in short as VAT, can be imposed on digital goods and services Similar to the way VAT is applied to physical goods and services. For example, when you're buying bread, we all know bread has a VAT, right? So VAT can also be imposed on digital goods. And this would ensure that digital companies that sell goods or services in, in a particular country pay taxes in that country. Another approach is to implement DST, which is digital service tax, on certain revenues generated by certain digital companies, such as targeted advertising and the sale of user data. However, NAMRA, you still have a challenge because taxing digital economy it's a complex administration. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Wow, Missy Pinge, another round of applause for her, please.
That was efficiently done within five and a half minutes. Excellently done. Again, another round of applause to her, but also a round of applause to all 10 of them. And, and, and if you want to, to just get an imagination or an impression or an idea as to what could have possibly gone into that. At the top of the program, I spoke about you taking a topic, deciding that you're going to write something about it, interrogating it, actually get to write. And I'm sure many people actually did write. Not all of them submitted, but you get to submit. As if that is not enough, you are subjected to this audience. You have to stand here for a good 10 minutes present to this audience, try and persuade the panel of judges in front of me, and they are quite imposing when you look at them, and you need to go through all of that, and they have done it with so much distinction as they have just did. Let's give him another round of applause. So this is what is going to happen now. That number remains open. It's 0811-410732. Three, two. But it's closing within the next five minutes. By 20 past 12, that line would have closed. Now, just as a reminder as to the, the order that I spoke about and the relevant quotes in respect of the participants, number one is Onesmus Joseph. Number two is Luboski Kalibula. Velemin Dungula is number three. Number four is Helman Scraver. Five, Zambo Mweti. Six, Pamela Kamupingene. Seven, Eliezer Kakwambi. Eight, David Ileka. Nine, Innocent Ithindi. Ten, Indileni Omua Ituna Ipinge. Those are the relevant numbers in respect of the participants. We would now take a moment for another set of entertainment. Again, we said... We are not going anywhere. It's all homegrown. But this time around, may I call on you to remain seated because it's just one musical interlude. Once that is done, we would then receive Ms. Kashiwongwa here so that she can speak to us. May I ask on Namra's very own Velem Iyambo to the stage. He's got company. But in, when he's in doing this, he's apparently no longer Velem Iyambo. But let's welcome Maestro. Thank you. A round of applause for Maestro. Uh, Maestro is not here yet. We can make him walk a bit faster. ready for this one are you guys there okay the song we are going to what? perform right now i'm sorry for those who don't speak oshwambo it's in oshwambo it's just talking basically about uh, the importance of giving strict discipline to your kids at an early stage so they become responsible people when they grow up okay so selector are you ready let's go Pico 
another round of applause for bringing the house down. Uh, Mr. David Andrews, I know where to take you over the weekend. I just got the plot. Th thank you so much, Maestro. Thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, may I at this point then call on Ms. Kashiwongwa to please come and talk to us. We, we have requested her to speak to us about the protection of intellectual property rights and the challenges of our time. That will be the, the central theme of her engagement this morning. And Ms. Kashiwongwa, please. She's the Chief Executive Officer of the Business and Intellectual Property Authority of Namibia, BIPA. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my apologies, I joined late, and as such, I will stand by the protocol already established and observed. I must say that this is awesome, and all I can say is Namra has got talent, and very innovative, and I think it speaks directly to the issue that I'm supposed to address today. So 
I think for today, if there is something that I would want to leave with you this afternoon as I present to you these um, remarks that I want to do today, I hope that I'll be able um, to bring about or, or to sensitize you about the importance of intellectual property and the impact it has on any economy and especially that of Namibia. So I, I would like to quote um, Mark Getty, and that is from Mark Getty Images, where he says that intellectual property is the oil of the 21st century. Look at the richest men a hundred years ago. They all made their money extracting natural resources or moving them around. But today's richest men, all of them made money through intellectual property. So my takeaway from this quote when I think about it is that the future of economies lie in the commercialization of intellectual property. Hence, the mandate that BIPA has is to enhance the economic growth and development through, uh, through the registration and eventual commercialization of IP, as we refer to it. Um, but in, in order for us to commercialize and reach to the point where we significantly contribute to the economy of the country, one needs to have an effective legal framework for the protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights. Uh, rights and to protect the, the rights of the holders. And when we talk of enforcement, we are standing in the presence, or I am invited by one of the main enforcers when it comes to IP protection. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just have to share with you a bit of boring information, which is why is it that BIPA was established? Now, BIPA was established really to deal with two critical objectives in our economy. The first one is to facilitate the translation of business ideas and opportunities into formal organized legal entities. And secondly, to protect innovation and also the distinguishing value that it adds to the businesses that we are mandated to register. Now, based on the, on the twofold mandate that BIPA has is that, firstly, we are responsible to ensure that Namibia has the relevant business vehicles to spur entrepreneurship and to enable businesses to enter the market. Secondly, BIPA exists to manage the registration, the granting and the protection of intellectual property rights. And through that, the objective under this mandate is to promote innovation, the utilization and commercialization of intellectual property rights and to contribute to the development of our domestic, regional, as well as in international intellectual property legal framework. It is clear that IP protection provides both inventors and those who commercialize ideas with an avenue to benefit um, their innovation, innovative efforts, to benefit from that. Now, IP further serves as an effective policy tool to unlock local creativity and innovation, and to stimulate the transfer and the use of ideas that encourage development and economic growth. I must stress, stress however, that intellectual property, when utilized as a, a tool of empowerment, can create wealth and foster social, cultural, and economic prosperity for Namibia. But very often, the, the impact of IP is not felt nor is it seen, and neither is it spoken about. I think most people look at the subject matter as a very complex one, but when you look at the talent that we have here, you can see innovation at our doorstep. Ladies and gentlemen, um, the pinnacle of our efforts at BIPA, or our higher strategic ideal, remains creating opportunities for businesses in Namibia to penetrate new markets and also increase the market share through the value that is added through innovation. Uh, they are also, it, what, what, what we do also allows for differentiation to exist and also to improve the competitiveness of businesses or even individuals as they present themselves and their ideas. To sum up BIPA's twofold mandate, uh, we are really there to drive and promote sustainable and competitive businesses in Namibia. As a sovereign state, Namibia remains open to both regional and international cooperation, as well as partnerships. So um, what, what we mean through that and through our engagements and our signing up to treaties and as well as the implementation is that we seek access to markets through these uh, various vehicles that allows our um, 
what is our citizens, our businesses, to really benefit and go out there and compete with the rest of the world. It is our intention to drive the IP agenda through regional, national, as well as international and sectoral partnerships. And when you look at the relationship between NAMRA and, and BIPA, it's really complementary. In order for NAMRA to enforce and deal with issues of counterfeit and so on, it is through the protection that is provided in terms of the laws that we are supposed to administer, being the Industrial Property Act and also the Copyright and Neighboring uh, Rights Act. Now, in terms of um, our country as well, we are part of a bigger uh, ecosystem. We look at the IP ecosystem, we look at the business ecosystem. And when we look at the African continent where we are based and which is our home, this continent represents great opportunity. We have about 54 countries on this uh, uh, continent. And through that, you can imagine the big market that we are dealing with. Now, when it comes to the, the current activities that are happening when we look at Africa, as, as was uh, spoken by, I think maybe it's Stephen, who referred to the Africa continental free trade area that is created, you look at a big market that is now being established where you have various participants moving across borders. And it's really a great opportunity to look at Namibia and how we can, through through strengthening our legal enforcement frameworks, cooperating together, how we are able to strengthen and also contribute significantly to our GDP when we move forward. So I think uh, currently under the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, Namibia has been participating on various uh, protocol or legal instruments that are being negotiated. There are three key ones that were now uh, adopted by the summits of heads of state is a protocol on investment, one on competition policy, and the last one is on intellectual property. So what it does, it then creates that connectivity between the different countries to be able to benefit under that legal framework as well. And as such, there is great opportunity that lies as we go ahead and now enhance the whole AFCFTA uh, towards e improving our own economies, but that of the continent becoming a significant force uh, on this planet. Uh, fellow participants, or oh, ladies and gentlemen, humanity has since time in memorial been seized with the pursuit to survive, develop, revive, and advance. The rate of success in this pursuit is directly linked to the utilization of intellectual property or the creation of the mind. Intellectual property protection is therefore a tool to manage and steward creation of the mind. Effective and balanced protection of IP has several benefits for Namibia and, will, and I'm try, I will highlight a few that I could pick through this discussion. The first one is that it benefits the economy through contribution to the GDP. It creates employment, there is tax revenue that is collected through the process, and it also promotes or attracts foreign direct investment into the country. There are also technology transfers that we benefit from through the utilization of intellectual property. As such, IP is a catalyst for a knowledge-based economy, which is where we want to see this country go. In, in so doing, it spurs innovation and creativity, it empowers businesses to drive profit through competitiveness and increase market share. It benefits consumers through quality uh, products as well as services and the expansion of the, of, of, bod of the body of knowledge to enlighten society. Intellectual property protection cannot exist, as I said, without an effective and a balanced uh, enforcement infrastructure. Enforcement is at the backbone um, of preserving the credibility of any legal system. And in the case of enforcement of IPR, um, in, in the case of IPR, enforcement is very critical and BIPA relies significantly on NAMRA when you look at issues of counterfeits and so on. And therefore, when I look at that, although we rely, I think it's very important for BIPA and NAMRA to really join forces and to work together so that we can strength, uh, strengthen the area of enforcement and give assurance to the owners of intellectual property that Namibia is a safe place to come and do your business, that we ensure to protect our, uh, our people by having quality products and not having some counterfeits where there is no assurance. If you look at medicine, for example, it's such a high risk if you have medicine that it, where you have counterfeit products because the effectiveness thereof, you wouldn't know.
because people just uh, copy and do their own thing and it might even be very dangerous to your health. As such, um, I just want to emphasize, because the infringement of intellectual profit, uh, property rights is a multifaceted and diverse, uh, um, and diverse or complex, complex situation, and you also have multi-dimensional impact when this happens. It is imperative that the approach is also multifaceted and inclusive in nature. Therefore, it is important that the enforcement infrastructure is built on collaboration and cooperation of the role players. Uh, BIPA and NAM, as, as, as BIPA, we really welcome the collaboration that we have with NAMRA. We also look forward to building together fit for purpose intellectual property enforcement infrastructure where we are able to contribute with our knowledge and enhance their enforcement mechanism by identifying these um, uh, illicit um, activities that would take place. As Namibia, we have an opportunity and also time where we can revive our dreams, the businesses and the economy of, 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 of our nation and also contribute towards nation building. And that we do through leveraging on human intellect, intellect sorry, um, as a starting point. Because the ideas, if I go to the grave, nobody can steal my mind. I'll go with it. So while we are alive, we have to share and collaborate and build on that. So the message really to conclude is that let's dream, create, innovate, protect, and build for our country. Thank you. Another round of applause for Ms. Kashiwongwa, please. Certainly, enforcement and collaboration in that space between us and where BIPA is, certainly an area that needs consolidation. And we, from the Namibia Revenue Agency, are obviously committed to that. But we thank you so much for your input and presentation uh, this afternoon. Let, let's get to the point where we now do away with the speeches and we get to celebrate the winners, the presenters that have in entertained us, educated us, informed us, possibly also enlightened us. May I ask on the NAMRA Commissioner, Sam Shibute, to please come and deliver his statement for this afternoon so that we can put these young people out of the suspense that they are going through. I know they are here, they are, pre they are present here, but their mind is somewhere else. Their mind is whether have I done enough to convince the judges? Uh, did I quote the right, the right provision of the law as per the presentation? And all of that. But in a moment, we'll put you out of that. For now, let's listen to the NAMRA Commissioner. Thank you. A director of proceeding, Master Yaruke Kuro Ndrokade. Uh, I want to first to recognize and acknowledge the presence of everyone. And I know that uh, sometimes these protocols, things take long. But I know that I just want everyone here to know that from NAMRA, we are very, very deeply humbled by your presence. Uh, I will not be able to mention everyone, but of course, uh, Ms. Vivian Kachuongwa, I have to tell you that uh, we are very, very happy and inspired uh, by giving us that importance of uh, stakeholder, I mean, uh, intellectual property protection. And also, I think we are just inspired to know that, look, we need for us to become creative, for us to be innovative, for us to move and to, be, to, to prosper. We need to protect, we can do that through the protection of IP. And we're very, very humbled. Uh, Master Ganjeke, one of the reasons why we are very happy here as the um, Auditor General of Namibia and that you are here is that we understand one thing. Namib NAMRA is mandated to collect revenue on behalf of the state. And it's through that revenue that the state will be capacitated to deliver on its uh, developmental agenda. But also when you then have the function of the Auditor General in your team, 
We should also be in a position to ensure that uh, the money is used for the developmental agenda of this country. That's why your reason for being here as well. We are grateful for the work that you are doing, but we are very humbled by your presence as well. Uh, then, uh, Master Nehemia, uh, water is life. Without water, you can't talk about development. But also just being here, leaving your office, just like all the other participants here, the student, it's a very humbling experience. And therefore, in Namibia, we are encouraging all agency to collaborate, to work together. And when we are here as well, it's an opportunity to spot talents. We have seen some talents at display here today. So for that, we are very, very humbled. Uh, then, um, Commissioner Rade Konjo, representing the Inspector General of the Namibian Police, NAMRA will never be able to deliver on its mandate without the Namibian police. We are required to be at all the borders. And if the police is not there, will not be able to be effective. Whatever operations that we are carrying out, we are always doing that with the police. And for that, we continue to be very, very uh, grateful. I see Master Mpofu from Transkalahari Secretarial, the Executive Director, your, your, your passion in helping NAMRA just for us to ensure that, I mean, uh, our mandate of enhancing trade facilitation through those corridors, especially uh, trans Karahari, and the work that you are doing for us in achieving one-stop border post, we are super, super humbled, and thank you for making time to be here as well. Um, uh, uh, Council, I know that my role is not vote of thanks, but I have... Thanks everyone as well. I'm just making it easy for whoever is going to do the vote of thanks as well. Because I do not have a speech. The speech, they have already been delivered here. Um, Mendapio Angula, uh, CEO of uh, August 26, he's creating great uniform for us at a very good price. And it's also good for institution of public institution to get service from other state own enterprise as well, but you, have to, you do a great job, but just to be here taking time out of your busy schedule, uh, very, very humbling. And uh, Mr. Eino Mvula, one of the top financial minds in the country as well, CEO of 91 Asset Management as well. It's very humbling. Instead of being out there in your office managing billions, you are here to support NAMRA, but also to spot talent. I think um, it's very, very humbling. Uh, the staff and management from NAMRA, I continue to be very, very proud of you. Mastro, George, we even have our own performer, and we are great for that which you have done. When the judges, the judges, we, 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 judges uh, you have been introduced, and uh, you have done a great job already to have gone through uh, the process of eliminating and up to where you are, and you are still working. So the judges, we acknowledge you. And uh, among the judges as well, we have do Dr. Benny Daruka. I had an opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Benny Daruka for 18 years. But I, I am an, a proponent, or I always advocate that in Namibia, let's give people their flowers while they are alive. For NAMRA to come into being, uh, Dr. Daruka and her colleagues at Bank of Namibia Research Department did a study, made that recommendation to government, and later on she was also at one point the chairperson of the task team that created NAMRA. Can you just stand, please, so that people can give you your flower? Uh, can you just stand? So, so sometimes people see institution, the NAMFISA, the DBN, and so on. There's always that few people who spend night and, night and days uh, thinking and writing and researching. So once again, thank you for agreeing to be part of this process as well. Um, I, I want to recognize everyone, including I cannot mention each and everyone's name, but of course the participant when the participants were here and delivering, you reminded me of one thing. Uh, last week, Friday, I was at the assessment professional competency 
testing for the chartered accountant. They were just getting their result, and I was asked to, to ring the bell. And we know that as they were in the group, and just before they get the result, only 60% of them have made it. But what we, were say, what we have noted is that in this situation, there is no failure. There is no one who has failed. Uh, because sometimes the requirement is that you only pick three. I am happy. I'm not a judge. Because definitely, whoever the top three who will get the prize money today, um, I, if it was up to me, you, you know, I'm, I'm just happy I'm not a judge. So give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> this is your event. This is your event. You have shown your talent, your skill. Namibia is blessed with talent. And uh, Tate Eino, Tate Nehemia, and all the other CEO here, please. When you see those talent, grab them. Vivian, grab those talent. It pains me when I see young Namibians. We have a lot of young Namibians working in UK. Some of them, we have, we have seen them growing up. Some of them are working in Germany. Because sometimes we fail to, 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 to notice and identify that talent and give it uh, and put it good use. Yesterday I had lunch with a young Namibian. So the, the, the German Institute of Research, they took him. And you must imagine the work that he's doing. Others are in UK working for the like of PwC. So you guys, remember you may have heard that Namara is only one of the state-owned enterprises that have its own television. Your content is already going to be on that television. Namara Kachenu. And uh, a great marketing opportunity and when the story of Namra is going to be told one day, your story, you will be part of Namra's story. And this event would not have been so successful without you and without all the participants, without all the learners from different schools, the teachers and the principal. And the reason why we have the schools and the teachers and the principal is because Namra is yours. Namra is the future and the future is now. Today you could be in grade 6, grade 10, grade 12, but tomorrow you could be the one leading NAMRA or writing policy that need to be implemented to improve taxation in, this, in our country. Give yourself a round of applause to all the students, learners, and so on. <laughs> members of the media, we continue to be very grateful to all the members of the media. Before I conclude then, I just wanted to briefly share, I wanted to briefly just share on the concept of strengthening stakeholder engagement to improve tax compliance in Namibia. Now, the vision of Namibia Revenue Agency, our vision is to be a world-class revenue agency serving with passion to positively impact the livelihood of evil Namibian. That's the vision of NAMRA. But if there is a vision to impact the livelihood of evil Namibian, the responsibility to impact the livelihood of every Namibian cannot be just in the hand of one institution. It's for that reason that all of us are here. It's for that reason that we felt that as NAMRA, you can, we cannot just have our own institution, our own meetings, our own management committee, and we make our own decision and proposal, and th we think we know it all. The moment you think you know everything and you know what needs to be done, the moment you think that you have arrived because among you within NAMRA you have all these masters in taxation and so on, we just then need to realize that the end is near. It's for that reason that we then thought it proper to start with this project on NAMRA talks where we are saying NAMRA is not only for those that work for NAMRA. Of course, NAMRA is not only for the government. NAMRA have an obligation to impact positively the livelihood of every Namibian. And therefore, let's reach out to all the Namibians publicly and transparently and get their view as to how can we do things better of course, we cannot have all the topics at the same time. This is just the beginning of many such events to take place on an annual basis. It's for that reason that we know 
There is a saying that two minds are better than one. In Oshuambo, they say, And it's for that reason that when we invited the participants to take part in this and do the research and come and advise us, we did not do what we did this morning for entertainment purposes. We did not do this just for us to appear to be engaging you. We are serious about your ideas. We are serious about hearing what your thoughts are as to the impact a bit of counterfeits, how to tax digital economy, how to improve compliance. Why is that necessary? One of our mandates, I spoke about the, our vision. Of course, our mandate, we do know that we have a mandate to collect revenue on behalf of the state. We have a responsibility to provide customs and excise services that facilitate legitimate trade. We also have a responsibility to protect society. Some people, they say, how do you protect society? So we are required to be at all the borders, at all the ports of entry, at all the airports. And remember, if weapons are to come into this country, all these illicit goods, illicit uh, counterfeit alcohol, medication, and anything that can destroy our society, it comes through the border where we are. The, the, the container with the cocaine worth 200 million that was, that was detected here, that which cocaine was going to destroy our kids, our families, and it was detected and, of course, intervened by the Namibian police and customs. That's part of what we mean, protecting society. Now, there is one mandate that when I look into the laws of many institutions, I found it only in NAMRA as enabling act. And that is section three, subsection F of the Namibia Revenue Act number 12 for 2017. That says, NAMRA, we have a responsibility to improve service delivery to taxpayers, and also promote compliance with revenue laws. Now, for us to improve service delivery to taxpayers, we cannot just think we know what needs to be done. We need to hear from you. For us to improve or to promote compliance with the revenue laws, we need to hear from you. We need to educate. We need to raise awareness. We need to invite everyone. That's why I'm so humbled by the presence of all of you. And I know how busy most of you are. And for you to make time to come here and to listen to this great idea, we are responding to what our president has been consistently advising us, that as Namibians, we need to hold hand and move into the same direction. Because stakeholder engagement is very key, and we need to involve everyone. We need to connect. We need to educate one another. An institution of this magnitude cannot be owned by only a select few. Because when you talk about the taxation system, you talk about, of course, tax, 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 tax administrator. You talk about the government and all the government department, service provider, taxpayers, the systems, the processes, so it's about all of us. And in Namibia, tax administration needs the support of all of us because we do know that the tax morale in Namibia is very low. The compliance is very low. We're losing a lot of money. There was a comment on Netflix and all the others. We're not, we are getting zero from those transactions. And therefore, in conclusion, I just want to make a commitment here to say we're supposed to have Master Oscar Capelao here. He started yesterday as a head of tax policy because there is two principles. We have tax policy. They are the one responsible to effect changes, laws, and so on. And you have tax administration. That's NAMRA. NAMRA is just to implement what has been proposed or designed by the tax within the concept, confine of tax policy. So he's supposed to be here. But what we are going to do, this wonderful papers that you have prepared, including those who, which did, some of them which did not make it under top 10. 
We're going to put it into the booklet, and also we are going to pass them to the Minister of Finance and also to the Head of Tax Policy. And I can guarantee you, as like I said, this is not for entertainment. Most of those ideas, through additional research, if need be, by tax policy, it should and it will come to pass. Digital taxation, for example, within the next three years, it must be happening, the law has to be changed and so on. So on that note, on that note, let me just express my heartfelt appreciation on behalf of the board, my colleagues from NAMRA, both staff and management, and our director of policy seating. These colleagues, they make things happen. When we agree that something must be done, they make it happen. This is your event. You are going to be part of the NAMRA story when it's being told. You will appear on NAMRA Kachenu. That television people, as far as Germany, US, they are watching NAMRA Kachenu. And we want more Namibian to start watching NAMRA Kachenu because Kachenu means today. It's the Silozi term for NAMRA today. And you must watch that television. You just Google NAMRA Kachenu. My senior here and all the students and the learner, the future generation of Namibia, we are super, super grateful. I want those who will not get the prize today to know that this is just a beginning and please continue participating and there is no one who has failed. You have just learned, learned and you have made your impact and you have that your experience, not but is going to take it away from you. And therefore, it's always that it's only three people who will get today because we also have limited resources, but we are super, super grateful. So to all of you, I want to thank you. I want us to continue holding hands, work together. The institution or agency in Namibia, they must continue working together. May Vivian, your memorandum of understanding with NAMRA must be signed as a matter of yesterday. I will be speaking to the colleagues again today, but not only with you, we need to work with everyone. But on that note, we are very happy. Let's continue serving this country with passion. If NAMRA do very well, and I've said this not only to the minister, not only to the president, I've said this even to our developmental partner, if NAMRA just do very well and start collecting every cent that is due to the state, if we just cut on the leakages and the loopholes and those money that is being refunded to those who are supposed to get, to get it. Our country is going to have so much money and we will not even need to borrow and we will prosper because that prospering, prosperity for every Namibian, that is a dream of our president. So I thank you. Let's give the, let's give the commissioner another round of applause. Yeah, ne, the, the, the speeches are out of the way. It is just now to hear what the judges have made of the, of the presentations. We know they are great presentations, and if you have got 10 great presentations and you need to award some of them, it can't be an easy task. But, but I see a lot of excitement on the Facebook page. I don't know how many of you are able to log on to that you will see the excitement that is there. Some people have already decided as to who the winners are, and, and that's actually great. And there's a lot of uh, positive comments there. So those that are streaming live, we really thank you. you. You have kept that platform live throughout, and we appreciate that. Now, it's the, the judges have done their part. I can confirm that. Where the, it's not a holdup, but the hurdle that we need to clear is with regards to the WhatsApp SMSs, the WhatsApp text that came through. There too, we thank those that have contributed. I think we, we were oversubscribed. We, we would have not uh, anticipated the numbers that we're talking about, and that's very impressive. What's going to happen now, while that is being uh, uh, collated, consolidated, and while we're getting the checks ready, uh, because you're, you're going to walk away with the checks now, uh, the, the payment uh, will also be done very, very, very soon. Now, to get that process out, I would call uh, on Mr. George Stein. Uh, as it is, as it so happened, apparently some people connected uh, while we were midway, and they missed his, uh, his intervention. And the request is that so that we can get another interlude from him. And who are we to say no? 
So we would allow him to, 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 to entertain us for one piece, and then we should be ready with the announcements. I, I know I'm committing the, uh, the, 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 the staff here behind the scene who are really, who, some even have calculators there and all of that. that. That's how serious uh, this process is. But uh, it's over to you, George. One interlude, and with that, we should be ready to make the announcements. Thank you.
Yes. We, we, we are almost there. We, we are almost there. I think the, it's good that some of us that do not have uh, numerical skills stayed away from that process. Uh, that process is requiring uh, numbers with uh, so many decimals. So, yes, we, in a moment we should be able to, to, to present the, the winner. So we, we beg for your indulgence for about three to four minutes. Uh, that should be done. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that we, we are doing this to you. Uh, we know that even when you went to bed last night, already the nerves were up. We subjected you to those process, uh, yet we are delaying that. So we our apologies. But we want to ensure that whoever emerges from those process emerges through a credible process, and there would be nothing that will come to haunt us. So in the next five minutes or so, hopefully, I should be able to to call those that need to come to the fore, and we make those uh, announcements. In the meantime, uh, the music that was playing was very good. Uh, I, I'm not sure if, uh, Maestro, you want to come and do that tradition again? The, 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 uh, unfortunately, he has only submitted one. But, but certainly, yeah, that is the good thing with artists. They are ever ready. So, Mr. Selector, if you can go back to Maestro's, uh, because I know he has only submitted one song, if you can just replay that and they, they'll keep us entertained in a moment. Okay, my apology again. We only submitted one song because we were just told to do one song. Anyway, this is also just giving me an opportunity to introduce my brother. That song is, uh, is, is track number 15 on my latest offering, yeah? I have an album. So far, I have three albums to my name, and that's track number 15. Then that song, as you guys saw, I, was, uh, I featured my brother. He go by the name UK. It's from a group called UK and Chichi. It's a good platform that I came back on stage just to make every, everything clear. Also to introduce him. You guys, this is my game. Oh.
you very much. I know because I did not walk in here with a piece of paper. You, you think we have not determined the winner. We have. May I ask the, the panelists to please, all of you, all ten of you, come to the fore. Uh, I promise this will be the last time I do that. May I also ask uh, NAMRA Commissioner Sam Shivute to also join us here. Uh, I see Ms. Kashiwongwa has left. We would have wanted her to assist us with that. Since there was so much emphasis on, uh, on transparency and all that goes with it, may I ask on the Auditor General to please, as a guest, as a special guest, uh, come and assist the Commissioner in awarding those that have done well, impressed not only the judges, but also have impressed the audience. Uh, Mr. Kanjeke, I thank you for agreeing to that impromptu. Let's uh, please thank Mr. Kanjeke. You can play the music while uh, Mr. Jege is uh, greeting the, the participants. And while I'm waiting for that envelope, I'm hoping it will come in an envelope, but not a brown one. You don't want to clap for them, all, for the, all of them, one more. But you guys have done well. You have really done impressively well. You, you deserve to be proud of yourselves. The, the winner will walk away with 10,000 Namibia dollars, which we are hoping would be paid to them within the next 24 hours. You know, we need to do some verification. There was emphasis on verification, digital economy, and the safeguards that must be in there. So we, we need to abide by that. The, the first runner-up in second place will walk away with 5,000 Namibia dollars, whereas the third place will walk away with 2,500 Namibia dollars. As we indicated at the beginning of our, of our program, the, the scoring would be composed of two elements. The, the judges score, and that has already been submitted, as well as the, the audience score which was your audience, you, you here in attendance, as well as the great participation that we received from the WhatsApp platform. I must tell you now, the, the numbers there are quite impressive, and we are excited that many of you could join us for that. Now, each of that element accounts for 50% of the final score. Uh, so the judges would have just been half and in part of uh, contributed to the eventual outcome, but it was also influenced by the public as well. So, uh, that envelope has not uh, been delivered. I guess they, that's the kind of suspense that they want to subject us to. But we are fine, we will manage. L let me take one trip behind. If you see me again, if I reappear, it must mean that we're good and ready to announce.
Yes. And we, and we are very ready to do this. With a total percentage score, and you would recall, I just explained now that that percentage score would be composed of what the judges have scored, as well as the public score. With a total score of 44.2% in third place, I'm here to announce and happy to announce Mr. Onesmus Joseph. He walks away with the third place and therefore walks away with 2,500 Namibia dollars. Commissioner would uh, facilitate that. Um, together, assisted by the Auditor General, Mr. Kanjeke, as well as uh, just some corporate gifts. Uh, Mr. Onesmus Joseph, we thank you so much for your participation. You have uh, impressed not only the judges, but then the, the public as well. Now, in second place, with an overall score of 54%, is, are there any guesses? Yes? David Ileka in second place. Any other guesses? Any, well, in second place, with a score of 54%, is Mr. David Ileka. Give Mr. Ileka another round of applause. And now, even I can feel it now. Even I can feel it. Now, for your winner, with a total score of 60%, as voted by you as the audience, as well as by you as the judges, walking away with 10,000 Namibia dollars from the Namibia Revenue Agency, your Texas. May I get any guesses? Yes, let's go on. Let's not stop. <laughs> All right. To put you out of this, the winner with a total score of 60%, walking away with a grand prize of the inaugural NAMRA talks is. Miss Velamin Gungula. Continue with the applauses. Ms. Gokula just took the stage and had us just throughout her presentation.
I think it will, we, we, we would give the, the, the rest of the participants items, corporate items, as well as uh, certificates of appreciation. Uh, the, the colleagues would assist with that. But as soon as we are done with the picture of the winners, I think it's only fair. Uh, our commissioner always tells us that you, you cannot just talk to people without allowing them to talk back to you. I think it's only fair that I allow Ms. Gungula to just have something to say at this occasion, something brief. If we can assist her with the many things that she's carrying with in her hands so that she can have a brief word to say, and we should then be done with this process. Uh, Velamin? Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I would just like to extend my utmost gratitude to each and every one of you that came here today, and to NAMRA, to the staff, the judges, the participants. I've learned so much today. Honestly, I knew nothing about the digital economy <laughs> for someone that's doing economics, and I honestly learned so much from all, all the participants, all the speakers. I'm honestly honored to be here today and I'm truly thankful for this opportunity. Thank you. Just to remind all of us, she presented on the effect of counterfeit products on the national economy. So a, a last round of applause for all of them. This is the last moment on the stage and we really do thank you. So thank you so much. Thank you for coming through. Thank you for enlightening us. All the best. Thank you. And we thank the Commissioner as well as the Auditor General. They are still not off the stage there yet. Let's help them. And, and that there is really where it ends for us. We would want to thank you so much for your various contributions. We know that at the beginning of our program, we highlighted the various role players and the contributors. But I think we should also take this moment to thank each and every one of you who has contributed to this, which we consider to have been a very successful engagement in one way or the other. Now that would be the NAMRA staff in various departments. We thank you so much for really putting your best foot forward for this one. But also the various entities that we have invited and have responded to our invitation through attendance and others, even though they could not attend, they wished us well with this event. And I think those well wishes have actually played themselves out in the event that we have had this afternoon. So we thank you very much for all of that. In your various respective capacities, we are not going to mention any of you in any particular way, but we are very grateful for the contribution you have made. Obviously, the National Theatre of Namibia for availing this venue for us we thank you so much that you have been of uh, great assistance, even the various uh, production crews, the colleagues from the media. We thank you very much, and we hope that you'll be able to carry our message, because it's there that the message really needs to get. Uh, the colleagues in the room have grasped it, but it's the public out there that really needs this message around the various aspects that we spend the morning on. So we thank you and trust that you would carry this message uh, very well. Because we have detained you this long, on your way out, there will be light refreshments there that you can grab and, uh, and proceed to wherever the rest of the afternoon takes you. But once again, wholeheartedly, thank you very much. Maybe we can rise for the singing of the anthems again, and then we should be out of here. Thank you so much. Yeah.
Yes, thank you. We, we may disperse, but the, the participants, there are a few items remaining with us. If you can just uh, give us a moment. But the rest of us are free to, to leave. Once again, thank you for making the time.